So I've been at Tolaris now for almost two years, and I get asked pretty regularly by my my friends, my my network, Chris. You know, how do you like it? How's it going? What do you like about Tolaris? And it's it's real simple. It's the culture. It's the people. And today we're going to talk to one of the OGs, one of the one of the originals, uh, going way back, and he'll tell us about how long Doug Miller is joining us. So check it out. Welcome to another episode of the Wireless Way. I'm your host, Chris Whitaker, and uh, as always, I, I am grateful you're here because I know you're probably either in the process of doing something or about to do something, uh, but nonetheless, you're here with us today, and I'm grateful for that, and I'm really grateful to our guest today, Doug Miller is with us. And before we bring Doug on, as you know, the bio, let's learn a little bit about Doug. Uh, Doug Miller's always known what he's wanted to do, uh, work a microphone, and market hot technology. I mean, is he not in the right place? Uh, age five, Doug hosted make believe TV game shows in his home. I can only imagine. Uh, age 10, he made friends with little league presidents so he could announce the games. I did not know that. That's a pretty good one. Uh, age 15, he persuaded a teacher with an overnight radio shift to teach Doug to DJ. Uh, and a production internship on TV's The Love Boat followed with several radio. TV and news gigs on both sides of the microphone. Doug decided the real opportunity was in managing technology businesses, but kept his hand on the talent end of things uh, just for fun, as you would imagine, not, not a bad idea. Uh, now with an MBA in business marketing alongside deep communications and technology background, uh, Doug Miller presently directs complex telecom project management teams and is also... The voice of Telaris. The world's largest telecommunications service broker. That was pretty cool, right? Did you guys get the goosebumps? I did. Uh, really, Doug's distinctive voice is known to many, both inside and outside of telecom. Uh, he voices and hosts many recorded live uh, Telaris events, including an 11-year run scripting and hosting the live weekly Telaris Tuesday call. If you haven't checked that out, I highly recommend it. It, it would be uh, very beneficial. And this is a company's flagship sales and marketing vehicle, uh, managing and working with teams in nearly every Telaris department over 12 years as the company grew 20 times its size. We're going to talk about that, I hope. Uh, Doug has gained a unique perspective on business growth and on the intense power of great communication in business and personal relationships. Doug, wow. What that's exciting, man. Thanks for making time. I'm glad you're on the show with us today. Chris, I couldn't have been happier to be asked. Uh, thanks so much for having me. And uh, boy, this is such a successful podcast. I'm thrilled to be here. Man, well, I, I feel like we're going to go up a notch today with this episode. So uh, as always, you know, we, we have the bio. We, we, we know what's on the LinkedIn profile. What, I, what we would love to hear, though, is, you know, tell us what's not in the bio uh, what other details can you share with us? You know, how did you get here today? You know, it's funny, Chris, everybody has a strange and twisting route to, uh, where they end up in life. I've just always been grateful that it, uh, where I am now really combines everything that I always wanted to do. Uh, as I mentioned in the bio, my whole life was about microphones and technology. I wanted to own microphones. I wanted to understand how they worked. Uh, I just wanted to be either be in front of a microphone or behind the microphone doing something. But uh, I, I think I drove my parents and all of my friends crazy. Uh, they didn't want to uh, invite me to something to announce it. They wanted to invite me something to participate in it. And all I wanted to do was, hey, let's record it. Hey, let's make a video of it. Hey, let's do this or that. And uh, so it was a lot of fun. But uh, growing up and doing that, uh, you find yourself doing a lot of other things. And I spent a lot of time working in retail, learning how to manage teams. I uh, had a chance uh, early on to spend some time learning how to mad manage agents uh, in the insurance business. Uh, I had a lot of extensive telecom carrier experience, uh, 
uh, working for uh, a great company. Uh, learned everything from POTS lines to fiber services and got a tremendous uh, background in the technology side of things. And behind all of that, I've always been involved with music. Uh, keyboards are my passion. I've been in various bands. I've done some impersonations and things. And so all of that sort of converged uh, a little bit later on in life as the markets were changing, as technology was changing. And suddenly I found myself working for a, a carrier. And uh, as I mentioned, from there, uh, it grew into my current opportunity with Tolaris. And uh, the story of how I got uh, from there to here is a little crazy, but uh, I couldn't be happier where I am and uh, doing everything really that I've wanted to do my entire life. That is a fortune. I mean, so many folks go through life working jobs that they don't like or, or does not bring them joy. So uh, I share that with you. I, I'm, I'm just incredibly grateful and love what I do. But I want to go back to something you mentioned uh, that you hit on the, the musical part and keyboards and the impersonation. So uh, what was your <laughs> most favorite? Uh, I mean, what's your go to if you're going to do a cover song? Who, who, who is it? What song? Elton John and Billy Joel. Uh, most of what I play is that. I've won a couple of contests uh, impersonating Elton John over the years. Uh, that's really what I love to do. If I disappear from the office for a while, folks have learned over the years that I've probably gone to the music store uh, and I'm behind an 11 foot baby, or not a baby, but 11 foot uh, grand piano uh, beating the stuffing out of it. So uh, having a good time, but uh, always enjoyed the music. That's my, my passion, my stress relief. And uh, in all this time, Chris, I have never written anything of my own uh but i play everybody else's music and love it that is fascinating um is that something you do like weekly or just occasionally uh i play a little bit every day um on the piano or yeah keyboards. mostly piano or whatever keyboard i've got a keyboard here in the office i'll noodle around with a few things try to pick out something that i haven't uh, played before uh but then the piano is in the other room uh, belonged to my grandmother. I've been playing it since I was five years old. And it's a smaller mm -hmm. piano, but it has one of the best sounds I have ever heard. It mimics the sound and the resonance of a grand piano. I love that thing. That's pretty amazing. One other um, item I want to go back to in the bio that I uh, kind of glossed over, but, you know, being a child of that era, the love boat. Tell, what was that like? What what'd you do there? <laughs> What a phenomenal experience that was. Uh, of course, growing up around media and things, I was fascinated with people who were very successful in it. And when I was in college, there was an opportunity to uh, apply for an internship uh, at a Hollywood studio. So I applied and I happened to win the opportunity to go down and spend two months of a summer as an intern on the uh, on the Love Boat TV show, which uh, at the time was one of the highest rated shows on television. Yep. Uh, so I went down there and learned professional uh, film production for a, a couple of months, met just about anybody who was anybody in uh, in Hollywood, visited a number of shows, uh, met a lot of folks. Uh, who have since become very famous uh, in Hollywood. And uh, it was just an amazing experience. It taught me that I didn't really want to work in film. I, I was more attracted to video, audio, all of those sorts of things. But the experience that it gave me and to be around that kind of technology and really have free access to most of the studios and people uh, and get advice from folks who were extremely successful uh, was something that I've always appreciated and tried to pass on to others uh, just how generous people were with me during that period is something I've tried to emulate. Yeah, that's so important. Paying it forward. You know, uh, I agree with you. I mean, every time I have an opportunity to help someone that I look and go, wait a minute, I, I was at that point one time in my life and someone helped me. It's just, uh, I think that's just the way it's supposed to work. Um, you know, another interesting observation here, you know, your, your, your love for, as you mentioned, you know, the, the audio and, and, and presentation and performing and marketing. And uh, it's interesting how the, the technology aspect of it has changed so much over the last couple of decades. I mean, even what we're doing right now, you know, uh, 
remote. We're both of us remote. We're not in a studio. We're, we're using uh, consumer home based, uh, you know, equipment and the internet. And you know, there was a time that we, you would actually have to go to an actual studio in a sound uh, room and whatnot. Um, talked about talk to me about that. I mean, uh, have you ever had your own studio in your room in your house or uh, you know? When it comes to technology, what, what's your observation about the changes and the improvements over, over the time? It's amazing. And, and that's one of the things I think uh, I'm uh, most grateful for in my life is just to be part of that evolution of technology. The happiest I've ever been was uh, in college when I would go over to the radio station. I had a, uh, a jazz program, uh, and I don't like jazz, but I took it because I wanted to be on the air. Uh, but I ran a, a jazz program a couple of nights a week from seven until midnight. Uh, so I could be on the air talking to people. And I was in a large studio. And this is the old timey radio studio that you always picture with the big microphone, all of the uh, acoustical equipment that was in there, the big production board and whatnot. And uh, I loved it in there. And I had it pretty well all to myself because it was at night. Uh, but I happened to be doing something there one day. Uh, during the daytime, uh, and it was August 16th, 1977. I remember it because it was the day Elvis died, oh, wow. and I happened to be on the air at the time. So I guess my minimal claim to fame back there is that I was able to announce on my college radio station to probably six of our listeners that uh, Elvis Presley had died. And so that date has always stand, uh, stood out to me just a little bit. I've never really had my own studio. Uh, I didn't do uh, radio or television work uh, for very long after college because I started to go a different way into management. Uh, but in the studios that I've had a chance to work in, both in television, radio, and some film work, those are just magical places. Uh, there, there's nothing more fun than being in a television news studio with uh, all of the, uh, uh, well, let's just say the movie Anchorman is not far off. Uh, everything looks like that. Everything sounds like that. People act like that. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And so uh, I enjoy that film. But uh, no, I, I, I've never really had anything like that personally. And I grew up, Chris, without the internet, without cell phones, all of that sort of thing. I've always been so grateful for that. I had a normal childhood. Uh, so. Wow. That is, you that's know, fantastic. More or less, yeah. uh, except that I was passionate about all of this technology and was always trying to insert myself into it. Uh, but then as I've gotten older and been able to work both in this sort of classic uh, audio and video environment and now with everything that we're capable of doing remotely with miniaturized equipment and the ability to uh, professionally produce thing in almost in almost any location. It's absolutely fascinating. So I've been very grateful for the opportunity to see and participate in both. And at this point in my life to still be working in technology and having such a good time with it. No, that's, that's fantastic. Okay. So now to the other obvious topic that we wanted to hit on, I mean, so many people know you by your voice and, and, you know, you've, you've shared with me stories of people that you've met for the first time and they're like, Oh my gosh, I recognize that voice. So, how did you become the voice of Tolaris? Primarily because Tolaris is very generous. Um, I began working for Tolaris about 12 and a half years ago. I had uh, really been burned out um, after working for a long time with a carrier. Uh, I loved the work, but it was very busy. And I'd been working so hard for so many years. I decided it was time just to go maybe sell pianos or something, do something completely different. And after a couple of months, a good friend of mine, Rich Fry, who many of the folks who listen here will know, uh, he called me up one day and said, uh, hey, Doug, are you going to get back into telecom? I said, I don't know. Uh, I, I love it, but maybe I'll go a different direction. He said, do you know Adam Edwards and Patrick Oborn? They own Tolaris. And I had never heard of Tolaris. Uh, which is strange because I've always been here in Utah for the most part. And uh, they're a big name here even then. And I said, no, he said, they're looking for some help. I think you'd really enjoy this. Why don't you go have lunch with them? And uh, he arranged an appointment with Adam and, and Patrick. We met at a restaurant and I saw the opportunity that Tolaris had. They were a small company at the time in the uh, brokerage business. I could see that they were poised for tremendous growth. Chris, I had never in my life had an opportunity to work with a company that was growing that way. I had always worked with very stable or mature or even sometimes declining companies. Here was something I'd never done. 
and they offered me the job on the spot. I took it instantly, began working for them the next day. About a year into this, uh, someone else who had been hosting their weekly conversation with partners, uh, they knew of my voice, they knew of my background and said, we need a substitute. Uh, the guy who does this is going to be away for a couple of weeks. Would you mind filling in? I said, sure, I'll do that. I, I went on, I, I did it as best I could, only having heard the call a few times. And uh, they said, Doug, uh, would you mind continuing doing that? <laughs> so I guess they liked what they heard. Uh, so I began scripting it at that point. Uh, and the goal then, as now, is to make those who come on the call, whether those are partners or whether those are suppliers or anyone else we might have, to look and sound their best and to put their best foot forward. And apparently it's worked. Uh, they've asked me to stay on. I've been doing that now for... Uh, I think we're into our 12th year now, so we've uh, gone a little bit past 11 years. Uh, probably more than 500 hours of content, all scripted except for the uh, Q&A portion, and I love it. Uh, it has been the best vehicle for me to better learn our business, all about Tolaris, and all about the wonderful people who come on. Uh, one day, Patrick Oborn, about six years ago, one of the owners of Tolaris, uh, began calling me The Voice. Hey, Voice, how you doing? It's The Voice. And I didn't really do too much with it because I thought, well, that's, I don't want to be presumptuous, but I kind of liked it. We used it internally for a couple of things. And then a few years ago at our big event, our Tolaris Partners Summit that we do, we were sitting around talking about the awards show, which I was going to host. And uh, I, I said, you know, Internally, we use this thing, the voice of Tolaris. It might be something that we could get more marketing value out of. And certainly we could use it at our live events. And I thought it sounded a little presumptuous of me to ask, but Patrick and Adam, who were sitting there, uh, their eyes just lit up and said, Oh, yeah, we have to do that. And so that night at the awards uh, ceremony, uh, as we came on and began that, um, I introduced myself saying, I'm Doug Miller, the voice of Tolaris. And the crowd, as if on cue, just started cheering. It was so recognizable. And so ever since Great. then, we've we've made a lot of hay out of it. We use it all of the time on the uh, Tuesday call. It's a big deal around the office. And many people who see me or recognize me come up and they don't even know my name. They just say, hey, it's the voice of Tolaris. So it's one of those things that secretly I really, really enjoy, but I have to try to be humble about it. But uh, Tolaris has been so generous with that and with so many other opportunities. Uh, I'm really grateful for it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Kind of reminds me as a kid growing up, you know, uh, American Top 40, Casey Casey. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, not, I mean come on. I know you were a fan. It had to be. That, that, was a, <laughs> that was a Sam. He didn't need to say his name. We all knew who that was. Um it took a little getting used to when Ryan Seacrest, I think, took it over. <laughs> but uh, um, We used that on the uh, Tuesday call one day. We had uh, some sort of uh, uh, an award that we were presenting that sounded a little bit like an achievement for top this and that and the other. And we got to the end of it, and I said something about, and now the countdown continues. Yeah. And it just <laughs> went nuts, you know. So, Well, you got to make it fun. You do a voices. good job at it. I mean, so, okay, so that's most folks uh, on Tuesday definitely know you for. But let's pivot a little bit. I mean, that's, that's kind of your, I dare I say, it's not really a side hustle, but that's an extra, extra duty in a sense. Your day job. I mean, tell us about that. That's, I think, pretty darn exciting, too. Well, when I joined Tolaris, we were a company of 24 people. We're 20 times that size now. But uh, in a company of 24 people that's growing rapidly, you get a chance to do just about everything. And I was originally hired just to provide uh, support for one of our vendors uh, to our partners within the company. But that quickly grew. Uh, we were doing more and more business every year. And so Tolaris very generously offered to let me work in various areas of the company. I had a chance to uh, found the original support team, which has grown to tremendous size since oh, yeah. then. Also had a chance to uh, form another team, which supported one of our largest vendors and uh, had a chance to work in commissions. I was VP of operations for a while. 
had a chance to found and work on other teams, including the project management team. And that's currently where I am now. I am uh, one of the uh, lead project managers for the company. And I have a team of people that works with uh, one area of the company. And we have several other areas as well. So I'm a project manager by day. I like to think uh, I do a pretty good job. I've got a terrific team uh, that I work with. We handle some of the largest and most complex uh, installations and implementations that come in uh, to the company. So that's the day job. And I love it. It's uh, a chance to, one of the people I've always liked is Columbo. And I, I look at project management as very much like uh, a Columbo case, you know, as just one more thing, ma'am, just, just one more question. We find where the dead bodies are. We find where the problems are. We solve the problems and work toward a, a speedy and a timely and a correct installation. And, and it's great work and our partners appreciate it so much. Uh, but yeah, I, I've had an opportunity to do just about everything you can do within the company over the years. And now as our size continues to grow, all of us work in a little bit more specialized areas. But again, the company's been very kind to allow me to spend probably oh, 30, 40 hours a month uh, scripting and hosting and recording and uh, providing all sorts of marketing and other content. I, I'm really the adopted son of uh, Telaris Marketing Department as well. And really, that's my background. Uh, my education was in uh, communications, and then I have an MBA in marketing. So I love both areas of the company and uh, spend a lot of time in each one. Wow. I love that reference to Columbo. I used to love watching that. And, and you're right. I mean, I think the... Um the gift and the, you know, the skill needed there is yeah asking those really good questions that people go, ah, oh, yeah, that's a good question. I didn't think about that. Yeah. Cause that's, that's what, what's the day, what's the saying, you know, devil uh, lies in the details and, and uh, we know salespeople, salespeople mean well, they're trying to get the deals closed, but sometimes those, those pesky details get lost in the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody needs to come in and sort that, sort out this mess, especially those large multi-site complex deals. We know, um, it's kind of amazing any of it actually works, right? Because it's just so many pieces moving, but it always comes together, generally speaking, uh, with the help of a strong project management team, for sure. Um, and that's fantastic. So, you know, with all this experience, uh, like you said, you know, uh, 24 employees to now 12 plus years, um, you see a lot of new people coming into Tolaris and into the channel. I mean, what kind of advice do do you have for people that are maybe just getting started either at Telaris or just in channel in general? As I mentioned earlier, Chris, uh, I, I'd never really experienced something like this. I had uh, channel-like experience earlier on working in a different industry, uh, helping to grow and manage agents who would do business for an organization. But I'd never really seen anything like the indirect channel for telecom sales. And I know other industries have similar indirect sales channels. But we've been going through a telecom boom now that has lasted decades, really, and doesn't show any sign of stopping. And the opportunity for partners who want to get into the channel and operate their own business or operate as part of another business, and then those like me who support them, uh, there is so much opportunity right now. So my advice to anyone getting into this would be look for a place to work, whether it's your own business or for a brokerage, for a vendor, for whoever it may be, check and make sure they have opportunity available. I, as I mentioned earlier, I had no plans of continuing in telecom. I wanted to do something else. But when I met with Adam and Patrick at Telaris uh, and I saw their growth trajectory and the opportunity, uh, I said, I have to be a part of this. I just have to experience that in my career. Someone told me, and I know it's an old quote attributed to a number of people, but uh, if, if you're ever offered a ride on a rocket ship, don't worry about your seat assignment. And that advice has been wonderful for me as I've moved through various positions. All through it, I've known that there's tremendous opportunity both within my company as well as in our industry. And if you see that opportunity, take it because most folks will only have that opportunity once, maybe twice in your career. And when you're in there, offer your talents. Everyone has unique abilities. You might have a particular day job as I do, but maybe you've got some special talents or abilities where only you can make a certain contribution. 
The company, if they're as good as you think they were, and if they offer the opportunity you thought they did, will recognize those talents. And as Tolaris has done for me, they will offer you opportunities to contribute. The entire voice of Tolaris thing came about because I just offered to help and there was an opportunity available. And since then, they have recognized that and given me opportunities. I've contributed not only voice talent. Uh, if you call into our IVR system, you're going to hear my voice. Many partners have asked me to do uh, uh, recordings for their systems, which I've happily done. Uh, and I've also contributed some music to Tolaris as well. Uh, while I haven't really composed anything, as I said earlier, I've been able to replicate some things and just come up with some uh, background this or that that they've used on some recordings. Uh, Tolaris equals opportunity in my mind, and the channel is full of that. So so three things, look for the opportunity, contribute your talents, and then pass that on to others as you have a chance to do so. Give people a chance to contribute to an organization that you might lead, and you'll be amazed at the ideas and the talents and the, uh, the capabilities that they bring to that. Uh, I've been grateful for everyone who's helped me, especially in these last 12 years of growth and opportunity. And it, it's so much fun to pass that on to others and give them that chance as well. Wow. I love that. Those are great. Uh, th th those are, th th that would have been a great last word segment there, by the way. I loved it. You know, three, three <laughs> things to leave with. Um, and, you know, as you were talking, made me think about, you know, just adding value. I mean, uh, you know, if we all came to work every day going, how can I add value? Where can I identify a gap or, or someone might need some, someone to come along beside them and encourage them or maybe show them a better way or, or just have a conversation with, uh, th that's fantastic. Uh, that is some great advice. Um, I want to pivot back to kind of where we began the call of, of this uh, conversation. Uh, the Tuesday call, again, that's you know, something that some of the folks listening may be familiar with, but talking to our suppliers now, I mean, um, is there a recipe or a formula that makes a supplier's Tuesday call most impactful? I mean, you've seen a lot of them. Um, I don't know if you want to share any that maybe you, you thought were the best or, or what, kind, what kind of advice we give to a supplier that may be, uh, you know, jockeying to become a, a presenter on the Tuesday call? You know, that's such a great question because I have tried over the years to nail down what it is that makes a great presentation on the Tuesday call. And we've had a few that I thought were going to go south that turned out to be some of the most memorable calls ever. And a few that were exactly the opposite of that as well. Uh, I'm not sure there's an exact format, but what I do know is that it comes down to enthusiasm. Uh, I'll handle the, uh, the, I guess, the voice and the, the communication aspect of it, setting them up. But if a presenter comes on the call, maybe it's a vendor, maybe it's a partner, maybe it's someone else. But if they come on and they're enthusiastic about what it is that they do and about the, the offer that they're making to those in our listening audience, uh, they're going to be a hit. So the first thing I try to uh, establish is, is this individual going to make an exciting presentation, regardless of what we're talking about? The subject matter could range across all sorts of things, but do they believe in it? Are they enthusiastic about it? And what is it that they want partners to go away with? I think at the end of the call, we always say, what do you want folks to take away from this today? And if they know that going in, it's likely going to be a successful call. Now, a lot of people believe that I set up the calls and I have a lot of uh, input into the content. I don't. Uh, in the early days of the call, this was primarily a sales call. And it was a chance for partners to get together and talk about their successes, their wins, their losses. And all of the partners had an open mic. Uh, and so uh, it really became kind of a conversation with everybody. Now, as we grew and there were too many people to do that, uh, and quite frankly, some of the folks would vent a little bit about things they didn't like in the industry, and it became a little, <laughs> maybe not as positive as we'd hoped. We had to put everybody on mute, uh, but we had the chat window, and so we still take questions and comments and, and whatnot there, and we'll put those on the call. But it became a little bit more of a marketing vehicle over time, and now we use it primarily to help partners understand the value that Tolaris provides to them, and it's a way for suppliers to come on and present 
their products, services, and opportunities. And so the marketing department and our supplier management department uh, does a great job of helping them prepare their presentations uh, so that it's something that's coherent, exciting, uh, builds to a climax at the end with maybe special offers that they have or whatnot. And my job, as I look over their presentation, is to help guide them through that, uh, make sure that it stays interesting, stays on track, and then set them up for some great questions and comments afterward, which once again gives them a chance to shine. I really view my role in all of this, Chris, as uh, not so much uh, ensuring that their presentation will be good coming in, but that it's good going out. Uh, I try to help anyone who comes on the Tuesday call look and sound great. Uh, We ask the questions that maybe they didn't get to or that should be answered and help them to leave the call feeling like they've put their best foot forward, that they look terrific. And of course, like here, we record those calls and send them out. A lot of folks listen to them later on. We want them to uh, sound very professional, and uh, leave the partners with uh, a next step, something that they need to do. So uh, it's all about preparation, presentation, and making sure there's a next step, something to uh, look forward to as, as partners go on and use those uh, those opportunities and the information they received. No, that's, that's fantastic as well. I haven't been a supplier myself in a prior life, and having presented on a Tuesday call with you, um, I, I agree with all of that. I mean, I think uh, uh, someone once told me, you know, the goal is, to be excited about what you're doing and transfer that emotion to the listener or to the, to the audience. Uh, that is an important part of it. I mean, we, we're all emotional creatures to some degree and, uh, and technology and telecom and, and whatnot can sometimes be dry topics. So any, any kind of uh, extra color or, or excitement you can add to the conversation, I think goes a long, long way. And, and yeah, I think and uh, that's a terrific point. Uh, there are times where you know that regardless, this is a dry subject we're talking about today. And so if you can inject a little bit of humor, if there's something you can do that will just be unexpected, uh, and Tolaris has been very generous about that. If I've wanted to go a certain direction, throw a little humor in there. I, I, I think we sang one day on the show. Uh, one of the direct, uh, it was Patrick Oborn came on one day and we Uh, He was running at the time, and uh, here locally in Utah, there was a a radio station that became very famous for uh, a large group of people yelling the station's call letters, Uh, and so I assembled one day that Patrick was going to be on the call, a group of about 12 people in my office, and uh, as Patrick came in, we yelled out his initials uh, as though they were call letters or something. And it just cracked him up. He he couldn't really continue for about five minutes. So humor, jokes, uh, singing, something different just to liven things up. Uh, they've never really held me to anything that I could or couldn't do on the call and never once told me that I couldn't say something. Uh, I've, I've felt a little concern after one or two calls. I remember one of our largest suppliers came on the call one day and they were particularly successful and uh, were going through a huge group growth period of their own. And I remember they came on the call and in their introduction, uh, I had said something about, and of course their goal being world domination. And (laughs) I felt terrible about that after the call was over thinking, you know, I thought that was funny. I'm sure a lot of people did, but I don't know if they really would have appreciated it. And I remember calling one of their executives and I said, uh, did you hear the call today? They said, yeah, really enjoyed it. Thanks. And I said, uh, listen, I just want to apologize if I went too far with that comment about world domination. They said, apologize? That was fantastic. That was exactly what we're after. I thought, okay, uh, maybe I don't need to worry about it as much as I think I do. So uh, it, it's been a lot of fun. God, that's, that is, that's a funny story. You know, if, if you're listening uh, out there and you're you're like, what are we? Ta- what are you talking about? What's this Tuesday call thing? Uh, for one, definitely you want to check it out. Uh, go to uh, tellers.com and and we, we, it's not only suppliers, you know, giving overviews. And I mean, we talk about you know top deals, other trainings coming up, uh, any other incentives. What what else do you think uh, partners get out of it besides just the obvious supplier uh, pitch? I mean, what 
that, that's pretty much the, the some of the major major topics, right? Uh, yeah, we spend a lot of time on that. There's always a featured presenter, uh, and it's often uh, one of our suppliers or vendors, but it may also be someone within Tolaris. Uh, we have so many tools and resources that are available for partners who work with us. We try to introduce them on a regular basis to the things that we do. It could be project management, could be account management, could be our commissions department talking about the things that they do. Uh, but more than that, we try to spend a fair amount of time on each of those calls recognizing partners for their work. Uh, we don't get to the uh, featured presentation until about 20, 25 minutes into the usually hour-long call. And in the first part of that presentation, it is all about recognizing partners for their achievements. And this has proven to be uh, a big thing. Of course, in any sales organization, uh, people love to be recognized, and we have so many successes to recognize. So we make sure that we uh, bring forth the partners who've had a, a great win, a great sale, done something spectacular. And the goal there is twofold. Number one, to recognize the partner or the agency for the work that they've done and let people know uh, that that uh, success is out there. But secondarily, we want those who are aspiring to that kind of success to understand that, hey, here are folks who are doing it. Here are people you know, and here's how they did it. And have them look for the same types of opportunities and success. At the end of the day, Tolaris has been about building people's businesses. Our tagline is, you know, we're built for you and helping partners win. And uh, we try to do that on the call, giving them tools, resources, uh, examples, and information that will help them do just that. The recognition piece is a big part of what we do. Yeah, it reminds me, Mary Kay, the uh, famous business woman, sure. leader, uh, the makeup, uh, uh, gosh, extraordinaire. But yeah, she had, she had a quote that, you know, everyone has an invisible sign around their neck. And it reads, make me feel special, you know, and uh, that, that, that's one thing to make people feel special, but especially when they truly deserve to be special because they are for accomplishing some you know, great task or a win. Um, you're, you're right. That that's a great way to encourage others because you're, you know, you, you see someone accomplish something great and you're like, hey, you know, it is possible. I can do that, you know, and I think that is you know, helping each other, uh, inspiring each other is such a, a great, great uh, mission in life to accomplish. Um so, you know, as always, these things can't go on forever. I wish they could. But uh, as we land the plane here a little bit, you know, um, uh, I asked you to think about last words. And I said, don't tell me what they are. So I'm, I'm anxious, just like the listeners. What, what, what are your last words, Doug? Is there anything we haven't covered? Anything else you want to share with us? You know, the thing that really stands out in my mind after uh, all these years is that the world has always needed and still needs good communicators. Uh, everything good that's happened to me in my life has come about because I've tried to communicate well, uh, whether it's verbal or written or using any type of new technology. Uh, it, it's really ironic, Chris, that as technology helps bring us closer together in many ways, it also separates us as well. We used to have to do this in a studio, looking across each other, uh, a desk at each other. Uh, now you're in one location, I'm in another. Uh, everything is virtual and going more so. And we have all of these different ways of communicating that requires less and less effort from all of us. Uh, my advice would be that there is still a need and there will be a greater need going forward for personal communication. Uh, my advice would be to learn to speak well, learn to write well, learn to present well, spell correctly, pet peeve. <laughs> um, because as technology becomes more pervasive, human communication will become more highly valued. I guarantee you the pendulum will swing back the other direction. There's competition from AI. There's competition from evolving other technologies. A and it, a lot of people worry, and I do as well, that it will it won't replace human communication, but it will make human communication more valuable. That personal letter that you write and send, you see this on LinkedIn all the time. Someone's raving about the fact that they got a thank you note. Uh, to write something down, to say something, to call someone on a phone or some other device and just express appreciation 
to speak well, to use grammar correctly, to spell something correctly. Those are becoming highly valued and they will become more highly valued. I guarantee it. So make yourself a good communicator. There are so many ways to do that. And sometimes it just comes down to modulating your voice up or down a little bit to make it interesting. Um, And the other thing I would say is if you've been successful or if you've had a great experience in your career, uh, especially in our, in our indirect sales channel, lift someone else up, give them an opportunity to have this experience as well. What I tell people all the time coming into our company or coming into the channel is this equals opportunity and you can take it as far as you want to go. Um, And there are so many that are willing to help. That's one of the things that I love about the business that we're in is truly there are people who are willing to help others be successful. And if you can become one of those people and work toward that as a goal, I can guarantee you not only success in our industry, but satisfaction in your career and in your personal life. Uh, I'm here because of guys like Rich Fry, Adam Edwards, uh, Patrick Oborn, people who've helped me, Bryce Hayes, uh, giving me opportunities. And I try to make those opportunities for others as well. Uh, Communicate well, give others opportunity. And most of all, don't take this too seriously. Have a great time because that's what it's supposed to be about. Man, great, great words to end on, Doug. I appreciate that. I mean, that human connection uh, can never be, uh, just don't take that for, don't don't take it for granted, right? I mean, that is, that's a big part of it. I mean, we, we talk about this being a relationship business and it's like, how can you really have a good solid relationship without a human connection, you know, that, uh, that personal touch, uh, great words there. I really, really enjoyed that. That's awesome. I mean, well, thanks so much for your time today, man. I can't wait to uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow's Tuesday call, right? <laughs> tomorrow, 11 a.m. Eastern, uh, Tolaris.com. If you'd like to join, uh, partners are welcome. Suppliers are welcome. Well, thanks so much. Doug. I really appreciate you. You are a, a gem. Uh, I'm so grateful that you're my colleague and coworker. I, I learned a lot from you, even on this call, this, this conversation, uh, you've definitely, uh, reminded me of some critical points. So I appreciate that. And again, just th- thank you for making time. I know you're a busy guy. Chris, congratulations on all of your success, both with the podcast and, uh, the wireless way and everything else that you do. I appreciate the opportunity to work with you. You're a, a terrific colleague and I congratulate you on all your success and all you do for our company. Well, thank you so much. And as always, man, that there, there is none of this without my team and, and my colleagues like you and our partners. I mean, it's definitely a group effort. So uh, thank you for that. I do. I love it as well. I think we do share a lot of the same passion for, uh, you know, we, we have different ways of doing it in a sense, but I, I love communicating. I love that transfer of emotion. I love understanding other people's emotion as well. So, so thank you for all that. And uh, there you go, folks. Another episode of the Wireless Way. If you like what you heard, you know, I, I one favor, you know, uh, leave a comment, share, tell your friends about it. If there's someone that you were thinking of during this conversation that you would you think, you know, should hear it, you know, share it with them. Uh, share the, the link with them whether you can hear this on all the different podcast platforms you would imagine wherever you find your podcast uh, you can share that with them so thank you for that we'll see you next time on the wireless way <laughs>